Welcome all to the most important cause America is facing today, and that is the need to reform the way we finance elections. To lead it off, let me introduce first, Karen Hobart Flynn will introduce an exciting new report. Karen has been with Common Cause for over two decades. She's currently Senior Vice President for Strategy and Programs. She was a key leader of the 2000 campaign in Connecticut that led to enactment of an excellent system of public funding of elections for that state, the third state in America to do it. For those of you that don't know Common Cause, we are a nonpartisan grassroots organization dedicated to upholding the core values of American democracy. We work to create open, honest, and transparent government that serves the public interest. We work on a wide range of issues, voting rights, money and politics, districting issues, um, and other impediments, in, structural impediments in our democracy that prevent us um, from broadening participation in our democracy. I'm really pleased to share with you this report, um, Our Voices, Our Democracies, that we worked on with a broad range of groups at the national level. We're releasing it today um, for, for the first time that talks about victories since Citizens United and the road ahead, empowering voters over special interests. It was co-authored by Common Cause, Center for Media and Democracy, Demos, Every Voice, People for the American Way, Public Citizen, and U.S. Perg, and we also consulted with many groups that are moving reforms at the state level um, so that we got the best information possible. For the first time, we put together in one concise report evidence of victories that have really gone unnoticed, resulting from organizing that has been underestimated at every step of the way and the emergence of a national movement that has all been, been dismissed as fiction by the Beltway media. And it's been built from the grassroots up. It documents a state-by-state -state strategy that has racked up more impressive wins than even you might be aware of. And that's why we wanted to share this with you and the public today. As matters of public policy, these are wins that span the spectrum from transparency to efforts to call on Congress to overturn Citizens United, and also moving small donor public financing programs um, and anti-corruption measures in jurisdictions across the country. And by themselves, they have not come close to overturning Citizens United, but actually we have made remarkable progress in this march in the last six years. First, we want to look at the national level, and in the report we talk about how the national conversation on money and politics has been significantly elevated um, in the last year. You can even see it with the President Obama in his State of the Union speech where he talked about um, the, the, that he needed to regret, he had to acknowledge his regret at his inaction on moving democracy reforms at the federal level due to the partisan gridlock. Citing the many challenges that, that our democracy faces, he called on the nation to a better politics and pledged to travel around the country in support of democracy reforms um, throughout his last year of his presidency. And it looks like this is going to be one of the last major pushes of his administration. And as a matter of fact, he is speaking in Springfield, Illinois next week, you know, the site of where he declared that he was going to run for president. Um, and we believe that we will be hearing from him about important democracy reforms. So we've also seen national groups come together in a way they haven't before. 155 groups signed unity principles to outline not just their narrow issue if they work on public financing and overturning Citizens United, but the broad expanse of reforms that we need um, to move and push back against big money. And th that has also translated into a fight big money agenda where many national groups are pushing presidential candidates to talk about these principles, not just the problem, but what solutions will they enact and what kind of pathway will they create if elected to move those reforms? It's not enough to talk about the problem and we've been seeing candidates respond and talk about solutions that they would do if they were elected. We're also seeing expanded um, ability to move in the state map many reforms and ballot initiatives are cropping up all over the country. We've seen a record number of ballot initiatives on money and politics that will be coming up in 2016, possibly in California, Missouri, Oregon, South Dakota, and Washington State, along with a number of ballot initiatives at the municipal level. 
as Americans get, grow tired of citizens uh, waiting for Congress to act and want to move to the people directly. We also see a number of measures that are going to be pushed through state legislatures, which have come into session in January um, and are moving reforms. Um, and we're seeing some of those reforms also with bipartisan support, which debunks the myth that this is an issue that just Democrats like. Um, we also are seeing, besides the major alignment around principles and the fight big money agenda, um, many groups are coming together to plan a number of actions this spring. Um, with large-scale demonstrations known as Democracy Spring and a Democracy Awakening by Avaz and 99 Rise and the NAACP and the Democracy Initiative and others. The other thing is this report outlines the many strong reforms that we've enacted since Citizens United. We've seen um, municipalities and states take up citizen-funded elections or small donor public financing. Um, and you'll hear more about this on the panel in detail, but in 2015, voters in Maine strengthened their public financing system, while Seattle voters approved a first-in-the-country democracy voucher program to empower small donors. In February of 2015 in Chicago, there was a ballot um, resolution urging the city council to enact small donor public financing. In 2014, voters in Tallahassee approves, approved a bipartisan referendum that included strict can can um, campaign contribution limits, ethics reform, and provided each voter with a tax rebate up to $25 for contributions to political campaigns. And in Montgomery County, they passed a small donor public financing measure a year ago and are trying to move forward in Howard County. We've also seen disclosure measures since, tw um, since 2010 when Citizens United open the floodgates for spending and from entities that never had to disclose before. So at least 23 states have moved strong disclosure reform so that we can uncover who is behind, um, who is behind some of the spending that we've seen in, on the outside. And then millions of people have called to overturn Citizens United. More than 5 million people have signed petitions and we've seen 16 states and more than 680 cities move resolutions to call on, on Congress to overturn Citizens United. And we expect to see many other states, possibly California, Washington State, New York State, to move forward this year as well. We've learned that these reforms are popular, and you'll hear some of our panelists talk about this. Um, when they're enacted, they can open the door to policies um, and to candidates that people had wouldn't expect. So in Connecticut, where um, I've been very active, but many others have, we see strong support. Nearly 80% of citizens support the reform. It has opened the door to women and minority candidates that didn't have the resources to run. And we also see a policy impact from this. Um, and in other jurisdictions that have public financing, where we've seen reforms in environmental protection, food safety, paid sick leave move when they couldn't move before public financing was enacted. We also are seeing bipartisan and diverse coalitions coming together around reform. We have groups like Take Back a Republic and Issue One, which are organizing conservatives and Republicans across the country around a broad range of reform efforts. Um, and then the Democracy Initiative, which is trying to engage citizen groups with memberships that work on environmental issues, women's issues, and others to, to talk about the fact that they can't move reform um, on their issues unless we solve this problem of money in politics. Um, so I hope that you will take, a ch uh, take an opportunity to look at this report. Um, it, it is available at commoncause.org backslash our voices. Uh, we also have copies of the report for reporters and others in the back. And our panelists will go through in more detail some of these issues and some of the opportunities that are moving in 2016. Jeff Clements co-founded Free Speech for People, a national nonpartisan campaign organization to overturn Citizens United. He currently chairs the board of Free Speech for People. Jeff has uh, served as Assistant Attorney General and Chief of the Public Protection Bureau in the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. Jeff was also co-founder of Friends of the Casco Bay, a bay just a bit north of us here. Casco Bay, Friends of the Casco Bay, he co-founded an environmental organization centered on protecting Maine's Casco Bay. 
Thanks, John. Thanks, Karen, for that great report from around the country. And thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, I was uh, here a little bit, not nearly as much as all the walkers in the rebellion, uh, but I was here on part of the walk last winter. And I can tell you a heated tent is a lot better uh, than the accommodations we had last year. But the energy is the same. I think we are, we are on a, uh, a mission here, all of us together. Um, and it's, it's really fantastic to be here with you as this uh, spreads not only around New Hampshire, uh, but all over the country. Um, I'm Jeff Clements. I'm, uh, as John mentioned, chair of Free Speech for People and president as well of American Promise. Um, and I'm here to talk about why we must have the 28th Amendment to the United States Constitution, uh, why we must have it now, and why we will have it, uh, because we're already so far along on our way. And if we all step up and do what I think we want to do in this country as Americans who believe in the American promise, we will win the 28th Amendment and a whole host of reform before the end of this decade. So let me start with the, at the top. I only have a few minutes. I do want to say, um, I think we know what a healthy democracy looks like. And it looks like what many of the things um, Karen mentioned and we all work so hard on and believe in, which is transparency, small donor or, or public funded elections, um, anti-corruption acts, state, federal, local. Uh, Americans, by and large, know what American democracy should look like. So why do we need a constitutional amendment? Well, um, let, me, let, me, let me spend the rest of my time on that. Number one, it's the foundation. We open, as you know, in the Constitution with we the people. That's what this country is about. It goes back, I'm from Concord, Massachusetts. The North Bridge is right up the road. It started, uh, we, I say it started there. I know there's debate about where the revolution started, but uh, the, the, since the beginning of this country, we've been built on ideas, on beliefs not on policies, not on particular goals, but actually on fundamental core beliefs, that human liberty, that we, we are equal citizens, and that we are responsible for self-government. There's nobody else. There's no king, right? There's no corporation. There's no billionaire. There's not even a president, no matter how good they might be, who can save us. Each of us is responsible. Equal citizenship, human liberty, our responsibility for government. That's what this is about. Now, here's the problem, folks. Citizens United, the case before Buckley, the cases that came after, don't actually believe in those principles. And I'm not exaggerating. As, 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 as Bruce said, equal citizenship is what we don't have right now. And the Citizens United Supreme Court says that's just fine. I'm not kidding. The argument let, raised by lawyers in the McCutcheon case, which struck down mechanisms to make public funding of elections stronger in Arizona and Maine, the winning argument was that our laws may not, they're not allowed to be based on trying to end the disparities that prevent some people from exercising their First Amendment and political rights. Literally, the argument that won is if some people can't participate, too bad, because money has a primary place in our elections under our current constitutional regime. Now, we all know that's not what our Constitution's about. We, there's nothing wrong with the First Amendment. We don't need to amend the First Amendment. We need to win the argument in the Supreme Court that's been going back and forth for 40 years now about the role of money and corporations in our national life. And the way we win that argument is the 28th Amendment. That's why we need it. So, so the amendment, somebody shouted out, what does it say? Check out the Democracy for All Amendment. You can read it. It's on freespeechforpeople.org. And it says that in order to defend and, and protect the political equality of every American, and in order to protect the integrity and prevent the corruption of our election and governing process, Congress and the states may limit the spending and contributions of, of money in our elections, state and federal. And then section two says, and in doing so, we can distinguish between human beings and corporations. And so that's what it says. Now, point number two, quickly, we must do it now. All right, this don't think and don't let anyone tell you the amendment is some far off thing and let's do little things first or even big things first. We have to do everything, folks. That's the beauty of our time in history, actually. It's going to be historic. The history books are going to be written and we're going to do everything. And like seven times before in our history, 
we're going to overturn the Supreme Court with a constitutional amendment as part of this. And it's happening. And the reason we have to do it now is because it's the foundation. All of our reforms are built on constitutional foundation. We need the foundation of equal citizenship. We need the foundation of human liberty. And we need the foundation of our own responsibility to govern ourselves. So that's why we have to do it now and not say, oh, well, someone else will do that in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. We will do it now. And that brings me to my third point, which is we are capable of this. <laughs> and we are responsible for this. And we are winning this right now. We are winning this amendment. Let me tell you where we are. As, as Karen mentioned, 16 states have passed resolutions demanding the 28th Amendment, 700 cities and towns. Now, that doesn't just happen. The reason it's happening is because millions of Americans across the political spectrum, 80% of Republicans support the 28th Amendment, 83% of Democrats, 80% of Independents. Americans want this to happen, and that's why we are winning. In Montana and Colorado, the two of the 16 states that passed resolutions, they did it by ballot initiative. And the ballot initiatives both passed, almost identical margins, 75% to 25%. Mitt Romney won Montana by 10 points on the same day those same Montana voters passed 75-25. So it's happening now. Let's make New Hampshire the 17th state. There's going to be California and, and Washington State are next up for ballot initiatives. And you can do this right in your hometown. You can connect with people across the country. And we can w w uh, execute the game plan to win the 28th Amendment, restore our constitutional foundation within the next few years. Check out Ben Good there at AmericanPromise.net. And this is volunteer. This is grassroots. And we have one of our volunteer leaders who's doing this locally, Sandy Milano, here today. So thank you, Sandy. Go talk to her to find out more. Thanks a lot, folks. Monsor Gitfer is Communications Director for Represent Us, a nonpartisan national campaign organization that's fighting to combat the undue influence of special interests in American government. Monsur has previously worked as deputy editor and contributor for the viral media site Upworthy, which is one of the fastest growing media companies of all time. I want to start this by saying that, you know, when we talk about the bad guy, you know, the big villain, uh, you know, in my mind, it's not any one politician or party or the evil Koch brothers even. Uh, our enemy, I think, is cynicism. And I think our enemy is this idea that a lot of people seem to have that there is absolutely nothing that can be done to fix this problem. And that's why it's so, so encouraging to see this amazing coalition of groups and of citizens has emerged to fight for this and for the huge array of uh, solutions that we all have at our disposal. So I'm gonna talk about one piece of that right now, which is the state and local ballot initiative route, which so many great groups have been uh, fighting for, and we've already seen it pay off in places like Maine and Seattle and Tallahassee. Um, and what's really exciting about the ballot initiative process is that it allows regular people, uh, just by getting organized, to go around legislatures and politicians who may be captured by special interests or not particularly interested in moving forward with a reform that would dismantle the system that helped them get into power. You know, that's a question we get all the time, is how, how on earth are we supposed to get politicians to pass tough rules on themselves? And the question is, well, we don't. We go around them. Um, and just by getting enough signatures, we can put these great reforms directly on the ballot and let the people have a vote. And as we've seen time and time again, when people are given the opportunity to vote for reform, they absolutely do. Um, and I think this is a really important piece of the movement for two reasons. One, you know, it's good policy. Uh, you know, a lot of times the money and politics situation is actually worse at the state and local level than it is at the federal level. In many states, it's legal for corporations to give money directly to candidates, which is not legal at the federal level. Um, and I think that a lot of the laws, especially with the gridlock in Washington, a lot of the laws that are most directly affecting people's lives are happening in state legislatures, in city councils. So it's really, really important that as we're building out this movement, we really put an emphasis on state and local politics. And then as a matter of political strategy, you know, I think the more victories we get, the more excitement we generate, the more momentum we'll create. So, you know, I am from the great state of Colorado. Go Broncos. Um, 
Yeah, that's right. I said it. I'm a crazy man. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, and you know, at the risk of uh, at the risk of confirming certain stereotypes about my lovely state, the example I always love to go to on this is marijuana legalization. Now, here is an issue that 20 years ago, you know, if people had said, you know, it'll be legal in you know five states, 20 years from now, people would have looked like looked at you like, well, like you were high. Uh, but by picking these smart local battles, by using the ballot initiative process, not only have legalization advocates been able to begin to turn policies in cities and states, but they've also moved the needle nationally. And I think that's a playbook that you're seeing uh, our movement begin to emulate more and more, and it's paying off in tremendous ways. Um, and then the other thing you know, we really want to focus on is the importance of grassroots organizing. You know, we have uh, 40 chapters across the country. Um, Every Voice has done tremendous work getting people organized. Um, constitutional amendment groups like Free Speech for People, like, um, oh, excuse me, uh, you know, like Wolfpack, uh, like all these different groups have been doing great work to get folks organized, and it has, you know, a really huge impact because these are the people that are showing up in those city council meetings at those state legislatures, getting the signatures for these valid initiatives and really making the change. And by staying organized and building this national infrastructure of our movement, it also makes it possible for us to defend the wins down the line because, you know, passing these laws is only half the battle. You know, we are taking on some very rich and very powerful people who kind of have a sweet thing going right now. And they will not go quietly. And we need to be there to protect these wins after we've got them. Um, and then the only other thing I want to add uh, before I stop babbling is, you know, how uh, genuinely nonpartisan, you know, this movement is becoming. Um, I think, you know, a lot of times when, you know, every Everyone involved with politics likes to say this is a nonpartisan issue, this is a nonpartisan issue, you know, to the point where it's almost become, you know, I, I think it's become deprived of its power in certain points. But I think that, you know, when you look at the kinds of coalitions that are coming together to support these reforms, it's truly remarkable. You know, when we went to fight for our first anti corruption act in Tallahassee, there's something really powerful about seeing the chairman of the local common cause chapter and the chair of the local Tea Party Network sit down together and go on a local right-wing talk radio show and all agree on all of the policies we've been talking about here today. Um, and, you know, I think the more and more, yeah, no, give it up. <laughs> you know, and I think that's something that we're going to see more and more um, because, you know, the only, the only people who disagree with this right now are the people getting rich off the current system. Um, and frankly, there are more of us than there are of them. So I'm really, really excited to see, you know, what the next year brings. You know, uh, as Karen was saying, there's going to be initiatives moving in five states, countless cities. The movement for the amendment continues to pick up steam. And this is a very, very exciting time to be part of this movement because, you know, really we are just getting started. Is Nick Nyhart, president and CEO of Evervoice. Nick led the Northeast Action Project that laid the groundwork for Maine's 1996 breakthrough victory for public financing. And I just want to ask, how many people in this room have marched in one of the New Hampshire Rebellion marches at some point? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, so it looks like about half the room, maybe a little more than that, has been part of that. But that's walking the walk, not just talking the talk. And I was up here in some of those cold days to do it with you, and I'm just amazed uh, at the number of people who stood up here you know, when it was snowing and 10 degrees, uh, to stand up for campaign finance reform was great and has brought us here to this day. Um, Karen, thanks for leading off with that report that was put together by Common Cause and Every Voice and national organizations, just pooling together and cat cat uh, uh, cataloging the progress that's being made and all the activity around the country. We don't have to convince people uh, anymore in this country that the, we have a money and politics problem. Uh, thank you. That job is done. Thank you, Charles and David Koch, and a cast of literally dozens uh, for making sure we know we have a billionaire-driven po political system right now. I think our job is not to talk about the problem so much anymore, but to make solutions part of the debate, a much bigger part of the debate, and to win victories that make a difference and inspire more people to join all of us here in this tent in furthering progress and being activists. I want to drill down on 
uh, the small donor-based reform policies, which have been mentioned a little bit here, because we believe they're the greatest game changers, especially, as Jeff has talked about, when accompanied by overturning Citizens United and similar cases so wrongly, uh, uh, so wrongly decided by the Roberts Court by just one vote. Uh, these systems of small donor-based public financing are game changers because they turn the current system on its head. Instead of candidates being dependent on very small numbers of people for very large amounts of money, they rely on lots and lots of people giving small amounts of money. And it means that every voice is heard, not just the people who write the biggest checks. And when every voice is heard, we're much more likely to get policies that reflect the will and interest of the many rather than the will and the interest of the money on issues from taxes <clears throat> to health care to energy policy to criminal justice to our paychecks. There are a variety of ways to write these laws, but they're basically similar uh, in that they allow candidates to run for, all, for office and win seeking small donations that are then augmented by a limited but sufficient amount of public funding. So it's not rocket science, and sometimes these laws are made up to be very complicated, and they're written and they take pages and pages, but in their essence, they're really very simple. The first step is that candidates demonstrate they meet a, th meet a threshold level of support from ordinary people in their districts, a set amount of money in small donations. Candidates then agree to sharp restrictions on taking large private contributions, and in return, they become eligible to receive public funds for their campaigns. So it's really quite simple, but different places have done this slightly different ways. So in Maine, for example, candidates gather lots of $5 contributions and get a flat grant of campaign cash, enough to win a typical race. In New York City, they have a system based on matching small donations, small contributions, six to one. So if you give a candidate who's qualified for the system $25, they get another $150 in public financing and public matching funds. And these candidates have to agree to spending limits. And there's a brand new honest election system in Seattle which goes into effect in less than a year. It's a, it's a real breakthrough. Their voters in Seattle will get $100 each in democracy vouchers four $25 coupons, really, that they can give to a candidate who's qualified and has agreed to give up large private contributions. They only can take another $100 in private contributions from any single individual. They can turn in these vouchers for real campaign cash, so incentivizes them to talk to lots more people rather than spending time begging for big money. So at the federal level, there's similar laws that are being offered right now, like the Government by the People Act. John Sarbanes will be here later to talk about that, and the Fair, election bill, the Fair Elections uh, Bill in the Senate. They all uh, include components of these state and uh, city models. The systems make everyday people much more important in politics, and big money count for far less. So uh, the voters in this country desperately want this kind of change on both sides of the aisle, whether you're a conservative, a liberal, a Republican, a Democrat, or somewhere in between or something else, uh, this is popular. So I want to quote, I'm going to quote you some polling numbers in a minute, but first listen to these members. Karen mentioned that less than 100 days ago, voters in Maine and Seattle uh, oh, you know, brought in new campaign finance systems. In Maine, they strengthened their clean election system, undoing some of the damage the Supreme Court created uh, by a 55 to 45 percent margin. That's a pretty clear majority. In Seattle, the vote for the honest election system was more than two to one. So these are landslides when you let the people, people speak up. That's why, Munster, when you talked about letting the people have their say, it really can turn things around. And here today, we need no look, look no further than the presidential race and Tuesday's vote in both parties to see the anger and the discontent that Americans feel to the uh, current political system. On Tuesday and Wednesday, every voice polled Democratic caucus goers in Iowa. So this is right after they'd voted. And 64% of them said a candidate's stand on money and politics was one of the top three reasons that they voted for who they did. And 25% it was they said it was their single biggest reason for deciding who to vote for in that election. And outsider candidates have been the story of this race so far, upending establishment thinking and the conventional wisdom. So Jeff and Mansur and Karen have all talked about remarkable progress around the country as we're seeing people stand up to take our country back. Looking ahead, there are more small donor victories on the, uh, victories on the drawing boards. We're working together, all of us, with activists from Fo Florida to Arizona, from Idaho to Arkansas. There's more to come from Washington State, South Dakota, counties in Maryland, Chicago, or counties in Maryland, the city of Chicago, the city of Los Angeles, and other places as well. Here in New Hampshire, the New Hampshire Rebellion, 
has made money in politics a much more visible issue and has mobilized thousands of grassroots activists like you over the past two years. After Tuesday, that fight needs to continue, whether it's to push the political establishment in Washington to pass the Sarbanes Government by the People Act, to win a New Hampshire homegrown model of small donor public financing, to keep pressing for a constitutional amendment, or to expose the billionaire's secret money. And I know all of you in this tent will be in one way or another taking up that call. But what's more, I know that together we can win. We can win these fights. So I grew up in New England, and I think anybody who grew up in New England, you, Jeff, you talked about the Concord Bridge. So you grow up, and as part of it gets infused into your system, reading about the patriots during the Revolutionary War. And I read every book I could on the American Revolution, who threw off British imperial rule because they didn't want the king thousands of miles away making decisions for them that they should make themselves. And stories like this reverberate, and they, they won that against a huge imperial power. And stories like that reverberate across American history. Justice overcoming injustice, always moving towards a more perfect union, no taxation without representation, the abolition of slavery, the right to vote for women, civil rights, marriage equality. We win progress against the odds. The big banks, the energy companies, and the other industries and special interests act right now as if they own Washington and the state capitals. But our, our history tells us that David can beat Goliath. We know all of us together can beat back the billionaires who are taking away our democracy. Powerful opponents won't stop us because we bring, bring our best when we're faced with their worst. And so it is with money and politics. So I look forward to, you, uh, look forward to continuing this fight with you. We're going to win. And uh, thank you, New Hampshire Rebellion, for having us up here. You know, it's, I, I, I uh, think what we're doing here is not McCain-Feingold. That is past. Um, we are way past where we were in the 90s in both the problem, but far more important in the solution. I don't think anyone here, and stand up if you feel differently, but uh, maybe I will let John decide who should stand up, but thinks that Congress is, that we sit back and wait for Congress to fix this. We will have a very different Congress when we continue to do the kind of things that Karen talked about, Nick talked about, Mansur talked about, and do the constitutional amendment. We're not talking about you know, going hat in hand to Congress and asking them nicely to do something. We're talking about changing history. And American history, when we're at our best, doesn't go backwards. Amendment work drives everything else. All this work, this is a movement. And it changes it, and Congress looks differently when we do that. So Thank that's you, why I think we can Thank do this. Thank you. Who Contracts create jobs, like BAE, like the supporting infrastructure around the area, the pizza place that serves pizzas. What's the economic impact of the removal of the big money from the... Can so I, I could, yes, you, did you want to? Yeah, can I just touch on that? And others may want to weigh in, too. Just very briefly, I'd commend to you a, a paper uh, by Professor John Coates at Harvard Law School. He's on our legal advisory committee at Free Speech for People. He makes the point that the worst thing we can do for our economy is have a crony capitalism, money-dominated political system. He calls it the problem of Russia. He says oligarchy is not good for the economy. Pay-to-play politics is not good for the economy. Most jobs are created by small businesses. They don't have the lobbies in Washington that you're talking about. And I, so I think the, he makes the argument, and I would too, but if you want a grounded, you know, Harvard Law professor of corporate law argument, he's adamantly with us on this. He's very concerned about the economic impacts of um, when you don't have a flourishing democracy with, with everyone engaged. It's actually good, good democracy and good economy goes together. So the question is, Thank you. if the Supreme Court gets to redefine words, how do we deal with that? They just redefine the language. Who would like to answer that? Uh, well, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, so the Supreme Court is always a, uh, it's one of the three branches, and very important, of course, but it's only one of three branches. And the way we deal with that is um, the way we have always dealt with that in America. Mr. Madison, thank you for putting in Article 3 about the Supreme Court, and especially for putting in Article 5 of the Constitution, which reminds the court that it's the people who are sovereign. Seven times we have overturned Supreme Court decisions in our history. Let's make it number eight with Citizens United.